Okay, so a very warm welcome to all of you for this uh, celebration of 25 years of EMA. I have to say that I'm sorry that we cannot meet in person in Amsterdam to celebrate this event, but I'm happy that we are at least able to make this virtual celebration, that this is possible. It is my pleasure to co-chair this event together with Noel Vation, the Deputy, Deputy Executive Director of the IMA. And today we are marking 25 years of the European Medicines Agency. And it is a particular pleasure for me personally, as I can draw on my own memory to recall where we stood when the IMA was founded and better appreciate what we have achieved over the past years and where we are aiming for the years to come. If I go back 25 years, and I also remember that Noel and myself were members at the old CHMP, at that time called CPMP. And I can only describe the general sentiment of the nucleus that would in time develop into a strong network of enthusiasm. There was a lot of work to be done and the goals ahead of us were ambitious and groundbreaking, but clear and inspiring. Looking back, I see that we have achieved them and looking around, I see a lot of persons like Noel who shared that enthusiasm and are still sharing it today as new challenges emerge. This is a critical time for Europe and the world, a time in which the EMA and the EU regulatory network have a crucial role to play. The current crisis we are immersed to reaffirms the relevance of our work and the importance of our contribution to society. However, in my many years serving the network, I'm constantly reminded that we cannot deliver our mission on our own. That is required a collaborative effort with many partners and stakeholders. In addition to our colleagues from the other authorities, we have invited to this debate representatives from patient, consumer, healthcare professional organizations, academia, payers and industry associations, without whom today we cannot conceive our work. I am delighted to have um, that we can have this reflection together with our current executive director of the IMA, Guido Razi, and the IMA executive director designate, IMA Cook. We are also honored to have with us Mrs. Sandra Galina from the European Commission, Mr. Christian Silvio Buzoi from the European Parliament Envy Committee, and Thomas Senderowitz, the Director General of the Danish Medicines Agency, and also the current chair of the Heads of Medicines Agency Management Group. I am also delighted and particularly pleased to acknowledge the presence of my colleagues who have chaired the IMA Management Board over these 25 years and the former IMA Executive Directors who have contributed so much to building what the agency is today. I would also extend a warm welcome to those following us through the live broadcast and remind everyone uh, that we are recording the meeting with the intention to make it available for those who could not join uh, it in real time. As we recently completed a public consultation on the draft European Medicines Agency Network Strategy to 2025, jointly developed by HMA and EMA, I'm pleased to inform inform you that the excellent level of response, very well balanced between the different stakeholder groups, the feedback received was overall positive, and it's very useful to both refine the final strategy document and to integrate it in our planning process as we develop and prioritize concrete actions for the multi-annual plans of EMA and HMA in order to begin to start the implementation phase of the strategy next year. This 
event today is an additional opportunity to gather your input and continue our di dialogue with our stakeholders and partners on what they expect that the network become working first and most intensively. For that, we will have an interactive audience discussion guided by the EMA Senior Medical Officer Hans-Georg Eichler. Finally, I invite you to follow EMA Twitter live posts by using hashtag EMA 25 years. And now it's my great pleasure to welcome Mrs. Sandra Galina from the European Commission to officially open this event. So Galina, the floor is yours. Good afternoon to you all. Uh, it's really an honor to be here. Uh, I must say, an incredible adventure to be here. So, the guests, ladies gentlemen, when I see the list of attend attendees here, I mean, one of the six, I hope that you all can listen to us and can see us. And uh, I, I can only imagine what sort of uh, event we would have had if it could have been, uh, I would say, under normal circumstances with me standing in front of you with a full auditorium and then conveying best wishes for the 25th anniversary. Let's hope this is just a blip and that we will revert to normalcy as soon as possible. This year, uh, uh, we have, I would say, uh, a theme, which is very good for me because I'm the new kid in the block here. It's about learning, learning and into new challenges. I have this person these few months, so believe me, what will be spoken from my heart. I can easily say that there has been a lot of adapting over the last few months. Um, and I would like to somehow do a bit of a, perhaps something not very original, but do a bit of a history path on how we see this, uh, I would say, the EMA growing over the years. So in 95, we set up uh, this EMA, this agency. Uh, uh, it was meant to hammer work of existing national, national regulatory bodies through scientific committees. And there was scientific committees. These scientific committees had experts from member states. You know, I was explained all of this. It was beautiful. But these experts remained attached to the national agency. So there was unity through diversity. And uh, this is something very dear to the European construction. And the European Medicines Network is quite unique in the world in this sense. So over the five years, we have two responsibilities. Um, they resulted in new scientific committees. Um, they provide expertise in very specific areas. Um, I would like to quote some examples that uh, strike me, in particular orphan medicines, for instance, that was established since uh, 2000, or the pediatric committee that was established in 2006, or, for instance, the committee for advanced therapies that was set up in 2007. I would not forget the Pharmacovigilance and Risk Assessment Committee, which my colleagues always refer to as PRAC. And, you know, I had to ask them, what is this PRAC about? So in 2012, PRAC was set up. The achievements of EMMA, however, cannot be reduced to taking up responsibilities or having committees to deal with the, uh, with the responsibilities. I would say that when I look at what this agency has done, um, one of the, and in particular at this moment, I think one of the best elements was when there was the implementation of the decision to publish clinical data. This is very important. This clinical data underpin the European decision making, uh, you know, and this has been, I think, a major step. When I think of today and of the need to have, I would say, certain elements very clearly public, which they are not yet. I think this is a major element I would like to recall. Next to this, um, in the last years, from what I read, the EMA has invested in enhanced cooperation and early dialogue with the developers. This is very good. This is very good because, you know, this, um, of course, is aimed at the academic sector, at the small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, there is this Prime scheme that was launched in uh, uh, 
2016, uh, and it enhances the support for the development of medicines that target what we call unmet medical needs. Another recent achievement that struck me as very, I would say, uh, very uh, topical at the moment is the creation of the joint HMA, EMA, big data task force. Now, this task force, again, is composed of experts that are appointed by, by national competent authorities, um, by the EMA, by the Commission. But, you know, this task force has given, I would say, good recommendations on the approach to use evidence from big data for regulatory uh, decision making. This is something that is very modern, something that goes with the flow of time. I would not like to forget, though, uh, the fact that EMA in uh, 25 years has been impacted by the events outside. And uh, one of the events that has impacted most on this uh, um, agency is Brexit. Now, uh, the impact of Brexit on EMA was, in my view, double. The first impact was moving out from London and coming to Amsterdam uh, after 24 years. Uh, and this goes to, I would say, people that organized the move uh, in, a, in a smoothless fashion. Uh, I may imagine the long hours of work behind that. On the other hand, I would say it's, it's, there has been on the agency, a series of, of elements that, you know, the agency had to mitigate. And, you know, it's it's important that we, we remind ourselves that this has not been all plain sailing and that there have been some elements that had to be attended to. Now, certainly the list of achievements is all but finished. Eh? In the next couple of years, I am sure that uh, we will have, uh, I would say, the results uh, of the hard work of the last years, I would say. And for me, I would like to look forward, especially at the applicability of the clinical trials regulation by the end of 2021. This would be really something that would uh, pay back for the long hours of work of many that are sitting around this table today. Or, for instance, I would also like to uh, see the implementation of the regulation of the veterinary medicinal products. This should start on 2022. Uh, may I take some of your time to just illustrate a few ideas on the pharmaceutical strategy, which we will publish at the end of this year. I would like to say that this is a blueprint for legislative and non-legislative action. It's very broad in scope. Uh, so, you know, is much broader than the EMA, HMA network strategy to 2025, um, even if it relates only to him, human and not to veterinary medicines. Uh, the pharmaceutical strategy uh, will look at the bigger picture and will try to guide policy decisions. I must say that the typical word that comes to mind is synergies. Uh, we will try to find synergies in the strategy. Um, but what I think will be very important to realize is that this strategy will try to cover the full cycle of medicine. So from scientific discoveries to market authorization. So from health technology assessment to, I would say, secure supply of generics. Now, of course, DG Santa is taking the lead on this file. But I will not hide from you that it has been the result of strong collaboration with the many uh, that are in the research and innovation areas, with those that are in the industrial policy, competition, trade experts, and also environmental policies have given its input into the strategy. The key will be innovation. When I say innovation, I, I, I mean something that is perhaps very interesting for many that are attending today, innovation needs to be fostered, needs to, we need to attract innovators in Europe. I mean, I mean really, this is very important. So I, we hope to have a strategy that will be future-proof, as people like to say, but I would like to say it's a strategy that will need to look into the trends and the frontiers of biotechnology and digital technology. Pharmaceutical uh, army was designed at a time when you know, the current technologies 
were very far from the normal practice. So in a sense, the pharmaceutical strategy needs also to remove those bottlenecks that have been created with the regulatory gaps that we have. So if, if I may say, uh, it should should address systemic problems of availability, affordability, sustainability, security of supplies. And you know that many member states are very, are very keen on this. And within member states, I say many, um, uh, I would say, users of uh, pharmaceutical products are very keen on the affordability issue. It's very close to the heart of my commissioner, so I tend to stress this element of affordability. I come to other elements that you will find in the strategy. There will be, of course, uh, um, the Europe beating cancer plan. And I think that uh, when the strategy will be published, you will find many echoes of the work that AMA is doing today. Um, if I may, as a last point, I would like to, to uh, have another word on the adapting to new challenges. Yes. Yeah. The, the last months have been very, very uh, challenging for us all. Uh, COVID-19 has put uh, under stress all the health systems. Uh, COVID-19, uh, in a sense, did not give rise to new problems uh, in the domain of pharmaceuticals, but it highlighted those that already existed. And this is a, a point on which I'm, I will never stress enough. It's not that with COVID-19 we discovered certain things. We knew that there were some elements of short shortness in supplies. So we know that improvements are needed. We hope to be contributing to those improvements with the pharmaceutical strategy. As announced by uh, the president of the commission, von der Leyen, uh, the commission will propose, uh, I would say, uh, to reinforce and to empower the European Medicines Agency. I think that the times call for that. Uh, we have been trying to work together with you to get your views on the reinforcement of the mandate. And I think that reinforcing our governance tools and building on the mechanism, mechanisms that have been placed uh, during the COVID-19 um, is something we need, we need to really, really do. A first lesson that this pandemic has taught us uh, is the shortages but, you know, I must say that we need to finally get prepared. I have seen a beautiful document of 2005, you know, and frankly, I don't know why we are not, why we are uh, facing certain issues today when we have that document. Well, be that as it may, I know that EMA will be monitoring the medicines shortages across the EU. This is really something that is extremely important. Uh, it will intensify possibly um, uh, the uh, monitoring um, when, you know, the executive steering group will be activated and, you know, propose even remedial actions. I'm, I'm very hopeful uh, in respect of the role of EMA. Uh, facilitating and accelerating research is perhaps another lesson, the second one that uh, COVID taught us. Uh, we need to do so without compromising scientific scrutiny. And uh, the last few days, I have been exposed uh, to many questions on this. And I would like to somehow thank the EMA for the task force uh, that has somehow dealt with the review of data stemming from clinical trials. Uh, this has been, uh, I would say, um, an excellent process. It will speed up marketing of this is something that we are all very grateful uh, for, uh, to the EMA. So, ladies and gentlemen, you know, there's a lot for EMA. There has been a lot asked, and I would like to say happy birthday to the agency. From the Commission and from myself, we uh, will constantly look at EMA as it's produced to the benefit of public health and the benefit of patients who are, in the end, the people for whom we are working. So. I am very proud to be here. Perhaps I'm the new kid in the block, but I'm very genuine in what I say. So hopefully we will celebrate together the next birthdays in presence. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandra, for these uh, opening words and also for giving your highlights.
on the future important topics. Yes, uh, key areas for the pharmaceutical strategy you uh, touched. And now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Christian Silvio Buzoy uh, from the Euro Parliament, European Parliament and the Committee for his introductory remarks, please. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. It is uh, uh, really a pleasure for me to be able to participate to the EMA's 25th anniversary. I'd like to start by wishing uh, EMA to grow to its further maturity and back up the resilience of the Union. The role of EMA is fundamental for the protection of human and animal health in the EU, and its work has a direct impact on the life of EU citizens. During the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, EMA has stepped up significantly to support member states, patients, and industry with enhanced support to medicine developers, emergency task force on COVID, and enhanced support to member states on shortage of medicines. I'm sure that uh, uh, we'll come back to this topic later in this event, as that is a key immediately challenge for Europe, and in particular for EMA over the coming months. I also like uh, to thank Emma and Professor Razi for the invitation. It is an honor and at the same time a great responsibility to be here today with you. First, in my capacity as uh, Emma's contact point in the parliament, then as president of industry, research and energy committee, research being a very important focus. Last but not least, but not last, particularly as the rapporteur for the EU for Health program, an important program, an ambitious instrument that will support member states to deliver more on the health of our citizens. And there, we just uh, uh, send a very clear political message to reinforce the role of EMA in uh, the EU level. As actively involved in the health policies in 2007 at the Union's level, and as Parliament Rapporteur for uh, the EU Regulation for the EU for Health Programme, um, I am very much aware that the role of EMA will be also very crucial in the coming years to support many EU projects related to enhancing EU's preparedness for future health crises. For example, projects supporting developers, facilitating clinical trials in the EU, handling of shortage of medicines, and making more use of the real world evidence. But I see EMA also as a partner in the next pharma strategy and in supporting access to innovative treatments to our citizens. At the same time, we need to reflect as well on the numerous challenges EMA have had to overstep in the recent years and maybe months. As mentioned already, there was a pandemic, the pandemic, and EMA plays a crucial role on the long term, having in mind that our expectation of the vaccines are high and urgent. As we have heard from uh, uh, the previous speaker, the chair of EMA's management board, the EMA has gone through a rough period over the last four years due to the relocation. And I know well how difficult it was. The relocation has thinned its resources, but EMA continued to perform all its statutory duties and continued to progress important initiatives for patients, such as dialogue with HTAs and support European data collection for antimicrobial resistance. In addition, it has implemented new, new EU legislation, such as medical devices and on veteran, veterinary medicines. Benefits of EMA are numerous. Thanks to EMA, EMA's work, EU citizens are able to enjoy innovative, safe, and effective medicines. Thanks to EMA's work, member states can share resources and information on medicines avoid duplication of scientific assessment, and access to the best experts coming from across Europe. Thanks to EMA's work, industry can receive scientific advice on how best to design development plans for new medicines. In addition to the above, over its 25 years of history, the European Medicine Agency has shown leadership and a positive example at European level with regard to transparency, because in 2016, EMA was the first regulator in the world to adopt a policy for the proactive publication of clinical trial data for human medicines and as regards conflict of interest with one of the most robust and comprehensive 
policies for experts, staff and management board members that exist across EU institutions. Last but not least, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Professor Razi and show my gratitude for his excellent work as M European Medicine Agency's director over the last nine years, which, as far as I could see from my perspective, has been managed extremely well despite so many challenges. And I would like also to publicly express my sincere congratulations and support to the new executive director, Madam Emer Cook, a very strong leader with a lot of experience and expertise, as we saw in every committee during the audition, whom I have the pleasure to virtually meet last July, and I look forward to meet again in person as soon as possible and working together in the coming months and years in order to reinforce European Medicine Agency role, to help to fulfill its duty, to help to work properly, and also to make and help European Medicine Agency to contribute to, the, to a better landscape for health policies at the level of European Union. Thank you so much, congratulations, and uh, many new uh, years, decades for uh, European Medicine Agency, a so important and crucial institution for the health of European citizens. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Buzoy, for your introductory remarks, yes, and also uh, having a, a review on the activities of the EMA and also look into the future of the upcoming challenges we still will be faced with. And I would like now to give the floor to Thomas Enderovic, uh, the chair of the uh, Head of Medicines Agency uh, Management Group and um, also a member of the management board. Please, Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you, Krista. Dear colleagues, uh, and especially dear EMA colleagues, dear Guido, dear EMA, under normal circumstances, normal circumstances, it seems like it's been decades ago we had normal circumstances. At this point in time, Danish time 2.30, I would have gone to Guido and say, isn't it time to celebrate with a good glass of wine? And Guido will say, I have a double magnum or something at home I would share. Most certainly, we all deserve, and you deserve more than anyone else, that we toast for you. So to consider this a virtual toast and congratulations, Ima, and congratulations, Guido, personally, for your leadership. Um, a lot has already been said about all the achievements, so I will leave the achievements aside. They speak for themselves, and I only have 45 minutes for my introductory remarks. No, I only have four minutes left. So I will look a little bit ahead. Uh, representing all the uh, national competent authorities in, a in HMA, I'm quite convinced that they all will join me in saying that uh, the system of EMA and the European Regulatory Medicines Regulatory Network is a unique setup. In fact, it's a bumblebee because it shouldn't be able to fly. It's far too complex. It can never fly. But look and behold, it flies, and it flies extraordinarily well. I think we fly very steady as regulators in Europe. We have a very strong focus on ethics, on science, and independence. And this must always be remembered. When others say we are not as fast as our American colleagues, I say speed is not always the essence. Patient safety is the essence, science is the essence. Looking ahead, uh, and this Emer and your call and the colleagues uh, in EMA, this is not a small task. But then again, who wants to work in a time where it, nothing happens? We can all, we are all scientists and we need the challenges. In the joint strategy, and I'm so pleased for the collaboration we have between EMA, HMA, and the Commission. So this goes out to you as well, Sandra, and your colleagues. Uh, this is fundamental. We don't always have to agree. And I have to say, we have an environment in which disagreement can, uh, can uh, exist. Disagreeing and having good discussions always lift the conclusions to a higher level. We have ahead of us enormous challenges, and we are not out of the COVID-19 um, pandemic yet. But the pandemic has shown us that collaboration is fundamental, fundamental. No single country, not even U.S., can handle regulatory challenges alone. 
This is why international collaboration is key. Availability and accessibility of medicines remains a top priority for us. We need to ensure that our citizens in Europe can have access to effective and safe medicines. You mentioned, Sandra, the importance of being data-driven and the digital transformation and the digital health we're seeing now, we must be ahead of the game. It, our citizens need this, the industry need this, we all need to be uh, strong in this field. Innovation is almost uh, developing exponentially. We have to be um, at least keeping up with the curve and therefore uh, being able to continuously follow what happens and be able to have expertise in this area is key for us. Pandemics, antimicrobial resistance, and other emerging health threats will remain a huge challenge for the world, for Europe, and for us as medicines regulators and for EMA. Supply chain, ensuring that we, the quality of the medicines we have is okay, and that we avoid having falsified and substandard medicines remain a focus area for the network. And finally, Maybe, maybe the underlying assumption and necessity and to which you also alluded, Sandra, we need to have a network. We need to have an EMA, but we also need to have a network which is sustainable and which operates in an excellent way. But the good news is I fundamentally believe we have all the ingredients to get there. Very strong expertise in EMA and in the countries, very strong leadership all over the place, and a willingness to collaborate and succeed. So, although we have a lot of tough challenges ahead, I remain optimistic. I'm the ever so maybe naive optimist, but with optimism also comes the ability to fix uh, and uh, hurdles. And if if uh, there's one thing I can also say, I see Ima has been uh, leader leadership uh, a leadership uh, role model with total optimism despite all the challenges you have seen. With these words, I wish you happy anniversary, happy next 25 years. I most certainly expect the next anniversary to be with wine and in person. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Thomas, for these words. And yes, we all hope that we are quite soon, we are all optimistic that we quite soon will have a real glass of wine uh, in order to toast to 25 years plus of IMA. And I have to say, when I look at the one picture of our meeting room, uh, which is totally empty, uh, yeah, my heart, uh, my heart is very, old because I remember when we were sitting there having lots of discussion, important discussions, important decisions. And I would like to give now the floor to Guido Razi to, to give us a, a look back to all the key achievements the IMA uh, had in the 20, last 20, Five years and also to uh, have a look on the lessons learned over these 25 years. So please, Guido, the floor is yours. Very good. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I, first of all, I want to thank uh, the, the four speakers, uh, uh, starting from you, Krista, for the very nice uh, introduction, nice words uh, about Ima, about my my tenure, about my colleagues, about uh, ourselves. The, 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 the network, uh, uh, us, the member states, and the Commission. Uh, so it's a particular pleasure to participate in this event. And uh, uh, on the occasion of EMA 25th anniversary, uh, still uh, um, we are happy that we've been able to celebrate, even in remote. And this gives us an opportunity to reflect together with all of you on what we have achieved over, uh, achieved, uh, over the year. Uh, I remember when I took uh, up my mandate as executive director in 2011, I was so excited about building on the many success of EMA and the network uh, to that point, and then addressing the new challenge for the public and animal health ahead. But I was very far from imagining, however, that two unexpected events of historical proportion, UK's withdrawal from the EU, and the subsequent relocation to Amsterdam, and the most serious global public health threat uh, uh, in a century uh, would have been part of those new challenges. So both Brexit and COVID-19 have brought unique challenges to um, the agency, challenges which uh, we have met head up, 
add-on, but there are also other developers which the agency has responded as well uh, as several key achievements to highlight over the past few years. And these achievements testify to, uh, to the advances being made in the medicine regulation in parallel to the unprecedented scientific and technological transformation of medicine development. So as I reflect on the key achievement, I have chosen to present them from three angles. What we have been able to build as a strong system, how we have continually evolved throughout the progress, and most importantly, how we have been adapting to address different challenges through the years. So if you give me the next slide, uh, about strengthening, I, I, I would say that over the last quarter of a century, we have built a, a European regulatory network rooted on the ground of a very solid governance, infrastructure, and interoperability together with national competent authorities and, as I said already, with the European Commission and our stakeholders. We have, I think we have developed a rigorous standard, coordinated efforts, and established methodologies for shared uh, workload and supported training with the network. Moreover, we have pulled together a large and robust network of experts in pharmaceutical. And this has underpinned uh, and continued to reinforce the regulatory excellence of the AU medicines uh, network. I think the agency has been interacting with its stakeholders since the very inception and uh, building an open and proactive and meaningful dialogue has been a, always a high priority during my mandate. And, and uh, I, I think we have today a very solid, a uh, very structured framework for engaging with a wide range of stakeholders. And I feel, uh, I have to say, I feel particularly proud um, of having uh, put patients view needs and values at the very top of the uh, regulatory agenda. In parallel, of course, we have strived for further engagement with healthcare professionals, bridging gaps between clinical research and clinical practice, and in the light of a more extensive use of real world data, as uh, many of you already addressed and mentioned, that is the next, uh, uh, the next challenge. We also have open channels uh, with veterinarians association to ensure their views are taken into account uh, as we implement the new veterinary um, medicine legislation. In addition to our established uh, framework of interaction with the industry association, also we have established uh, stronger links with academia in view of upcoming innovation and the rapid advance uh, advancement of scientific research and to narrow the gap between scientific knowledge and the translation into medicines for patients and our own gap of knowledge. And, and the agency also has been facing, have been uh, uh, forging closer collaboration with our other key players, such as health technology assessment bodies and payers to find ways to ensure that developers of medicines can produce evidence during the development process that meets the needs of all of us, of all the communities. Uh, several EMA initiatives aimed at supporting research and innovation uh, and has been developed uh, in, in, in over these years, uh, including the EU Innovation uh, Network, the launch of primers already uh, mentioned, uh, the prime scheme will launch uh, in March 2016, and a lot of dedicated support to uh, SMEs that uh, we offer throughout uh, uh, to the agency SME office. Uh, in the past decades, I've also seen the approval of ATMPs under the EU, the, the current EU legal framework for advanced therapies, for example, the CAR T cell and the successful introduction of biosimilars in the EU market. Over 100 and 700 medicines have been approved in 25 years, including for rare diseases, pediatrics, and for veterinary use. 
And over the years, we have also built a very robust pharmacovigilance system with the new legislation coming into effect in 2012 within all the EU member states. And uh, going about the, the, the evolution, uh, the, the, the next slide, please. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, to, to, I will say that throughout these many years, uh, um, and as we experience our expansion uh, through the EU enlargement waves, we ha certainly have learned that one important thing to work together and to share best practice within the network. We learn how to take into account the rich diversity of our cultural uh, and our healthcare system and to recognize the value of collective effort and coordinated action. And the multinational teams constantly increasing are one successful example of this evolution. And by facing unprecedented uh, challenges such as Brexit and COVID pandemic, uh, which have triggered an extraordinary resource mobilization with the network, we had a uh, humble opportunity to, to learn even more at a very fast pace, unfortunately, but at a very fast pace. The experience gain uh, and the lessons uh, we will learn from uh, them will help us to continue to introduce future efficiency gains in the system. Uh, I, I also think an important aspect of our work has focused on the strengthening international collaboration and exchange beyond the EU. This is now especially relevant, we have seen uh, during the, the, the context of the COVID-19. The consensus and common standards uh, are being achieved through platforms such as International Council for Organization and Technical Requirement, the, the so-called ICH, and the International Coalition of Medicine Regulatory Authority, whose executive committee now is currently chaired by EMA. Uh, we have up to 30 platforms for exchange within the national authorities, and, uh, uh, and this has been established under the confidentiality agreements. We have gained experience initial parallel scientific advice with FDA to companies, helping to promote the convergence before trial are performed. We have several topic clusters uh, also with FDA, for example, cancer, that has been established and very and with very useful and positive outcome and are becoming our in a daily practice, I would say. And the critical collaboration has also been established for other topics such of course uh, MR, vaccines. And during my mandate, I, I made great effort to communicate the science. Uh, we we established, I think behind the regulatory decision, we need to communicate it how and why we come to this decision. And that's why I had put a, a, a specific uh, uh, division to this, a specific uh, structure to this. And in parallel, of course, uh, the, the transparency, uh, we have been very committed to transparency. And since 2016, we provided not only the details of assessment, but the access to the full clinical data. And about adapting, the next slide, please. Of course, we should also mention all the work employing advancing the implementation of the new legislation, uh, including pharma vigilance, ph falsified medicine, clinical trial, medical devices, and veterinary medicines, and taking up the responsibility and task for EMA and the network, and trying to anticipate uh, scientific and regulatory challenges that will enable translation of the research and innovation. Uh, by developing EMA regulatory science strategy 2025, our objective is and, and will be to support uh, through appropriate regulatory standard the development of increasingly complex medicines that more and more will deliver solution uh, for healthcare by converging different technology to promote and to protect uh, uh, of course, uh, human and animal health. Uh, I will not uh, expand more on big data and real world evidence and the patient level evidence. This uh, has been already mentioned, and this is uh, uh, one of the 
I, I think we have put the seed and I, I'm sure this will grow and will be implemented. I, of course, I could not finish uh, this reflection without highlighting the area where I believe EMA and the EU network with the support of a chief are truly leading the way. By coordinating multiple medicine regulatory systems across the EU for the benefit of its citizens, I think we're, as uh, Thomas mentioned, we have developed a, a unique cooperative model for regulation. And that is of enormous interest in other regions of the world uh, who look at us as a reference point. And as I mentioned, I mentioned before, uh, EMA has taken the European regulatory system uh, to an unprecedented level of transparency in data disclosure. And this level of transparency is being uh, now further enhanced uh, during the COVID-19 medicine. And we know how much of this trust and this uh, uh, now is needed. And we are, we are, we are very happy that, that, that the seed has planted much, much a long time ago. Uh, the agency also pioneered uh, new methodologies uh, to ensure systematic involvement of patients uh, for the entire, throughout the entire uh, life cycle of medicine, provided a really uh, well acknowledged source of experience to many regulators across the, the globe. In addition, of course, we have uh, uh, put uh, created a successful frame for biosimilar in near you that now is uh, uh, pretty much followed uh, beyond the EU. And this was uh, a good guidance to address uh, for, for the patient, for healthcare professional, and also addressing anticipating public uh, misconception. And uh, the next slide to come to a conclusion. Uh, uh, I think in all these years, we have really been able to go through so many challenges by our capacity to work together. That was the key, supported by external people who work in our agency and at the European Commission, and also by some of our stakeholders. I'm convinced that all the experience and lessons learned from the past 25 years have paved the way for the future. Together, I hope we have, uh, on one hand, enabled and supported innovation and translated science and research into new effective medicines, and on the other hand, we reinforce the, um, our role of guardian of the public health, uh, guaranteeing that these medicines are proven according to the rigorous standard of quality, safety, and efficacy, and they, they remain so once in the market. I have been at, it has been a tremendous journey, I have to say, and I could uh, not feel proud to have been part of it. As my tenure at the helm of these ages, it came to an end uh, in a few weeks. I'm very confident and happy to pass the helm to Emet, who will continue this journey and will go from strength to strength. Thank you for listening. And thank you for all the cooperation. Over to you, Madam Chair. Over to you, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Guido, um, for this. Uh, review what FEMA has achieved in the recent past and also some thoughts for the future. And concerning thoughts for the future, I would like to give the floor now to uh, your successor, to uh, Emer Cook. Uh, and we are looking forward to listen to your words. What are your future uh, thoughts about medicines regulation in the involving landscape? And so please, Emer, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Krista, and thank you to all the previous speakers. It's really a pleasure to be here, to have this opportunity in my current, not yet in my current role, but to share in this very important event. Uh, I have to say I feel humbled by the kind words from all the previous speakers. Um, and I don't know if all of you know, but I was actually asked the first inauguration of the EMA 25 years ago in the Texaco building in West Ferry Circus. And uh, I feel like we've come an awful long way. So it's 
but I have to say, I also would much prefer if this was to be a more social event in addition to a scientific event, if we could be together, because part of all of what has been built in terms of the EMA and the network has been about working together with the network, with stakeholders, and this is something that I am very committed to going forward. I, I think I have a few slides that I would like to share with you. Um, so really, maybe we move straight to the next slide. Um, because what this is about really is building on a very, very solid foundation. Um, I know that we're all caught up in the, in the COVID crisis, but I want to, as I prepare to join EMA next month, I'd like to highlight first what EMA and the network have built and consolidated over the years. This is a solid foundation which has effectively protected public and animal health in Europe. This means that EU citizens can trust that the medicines they take are safe, effective and, high, and of high quality. And this is especially relevant in times of crisis such as the one we're in at the moment. But if EMA is to continue its mission success and successfully, we have to continue to enhance our strong partnerships in the network and make use of all elements of our resources on scientific expertise, knowledge uh, and, and collaboration. We need to increase our regulatory efficiency and flexibility, and we need to ensure that our procedures are agile and pragmatic, because this is the way that we'll be able to respond rapidly to challenges. At the same time, we need to strengthen the quality of our scientific evaluations as we expand our data in sources in an increasingly digitalized world. And I was really glad to see that both Sandra and Thomas referred to this today. Building on what Guido has said, I, I believe it's very important to support new waves of innovation that drive science and research into the delivery of new therapies of tomorrow. We need to ensure that these disruptive technologies and innovation can translate into real and longer term benefit for patients. It's important to do that, that we we maintain rigorous standards of pharmaceutical quality, safety and efficacy, because these are the hallmarks of EU medicines regulation and have always been so and must continue to be. To achieve this, we need to make sure that we can maintain and further develop close collaboration with regulators across the world and that we can strengthen our dialogue with stakeholders. I'm particularly proud to be taking over from Guido as the chair of the International Coalition of Medicines Regulatory Agencies, because this gives the opportunity to build on some wonderful work that has been done by the area. Effective communication about the benefits and risks of medicines, in particular now about the safety of vaccines, will continue to be a crucial element for the years to come. We have to listen to what our patients and citizens are saying. We have to understand how they see uh, the medicines that we regulate. And we need to make sure that we can turn science-based decisions into high quality information that meets citizens' needs. So I, I didn't want to start with COVID-19, but we're all aware that I am joining this agency amid a public health crisis of unprecedented scale. EMA plays a crucial role in the public health response to COVID-19. The agency is demonstrating its capacity to respond to this crisis as it supports the development and evaluation of treatments and vaccines against the agency. But it, this is also about making sure that the that the medicines are available to patients and public as quickly as possible. And we need to continue to make sure that the entire system shows this unprecedented level of agility, of flexibility and transparency, which will need to be sustained, not just for the evaluation of these new products, but also post-marketing. 
And we have to recognize that these challenges pose significant uh, challenges for us in terms of resources, a strain on the EMA and the network's resources. But COVID-19 is not in isolation a unique threat. There are many other challenges, as, as our, my previous speakers have mentioned, which are changing as we speak. If we look again at the issue of antimicrobial resistance, this risk will continue and requires a sustained global effort in which the EMA and the network need to work together, but not just together, together with many, many other actors. The pandemic has accelerated the need for the agency to take an even more active role and to be able to address challenges, and this will be certainly one of my priorities as EMA's new executive director. We need to see the big picture. We need to ensure integration. We need to ensure alignment to achieve, to make sure that EMA can deliver in the wider policy areas, we need greater integration. We have a very, very important opportunity in front of us together with the heads of medicines agency and, e and, e and the European Commission. We can shape the future role of medicines regulation nationally and at EU level. But to seize this opportunity, we need to strengthen the partnerships that are needed, and we need to further integrate EMA's activities in the context of what we've heard about the EU network and policy strategies. As, as Sandra mentioned, dealing with problems of medicines availability will remain an EU priority, and I, I recognize it as an area of great concern, and I put this in my remarks to the management board at the time of my election and in my thoughts to the ENVI committee um, when, when I was uh, in front of them. More and more complex medicines reach the market. We need to ensure that all EU patients and healthcare systems are able to access and afford them. Now, more than ever, we need to intensify our efforts to minimize shortages, increase medicines available, and this will include strengthening supervision and the resilience of the, of the supply chain. No matter what kind of medicine it is, whether it's basic or innovative, it has absolutely no value if it doesn't reach the patient or animal. And if, it, if this is for pricing, availability, or market reasons, we need to understand and we need to put measures in place to make sure they can be addressed. COVID-19 puts the spotlight on this issue because availability has become a day-to-day -day challenge across all therapeutic areas. And I strongly believe that EMA needs to work on this issue very, very closely with the member states, the commission, and all uh, patient and healthcare professionals. And I'm really delighted to see that so many patient organizations and healthcare professionals have joined us here today. Cooperation with decision makers such as health technology assessment bodies and payers to ensuring availability. And I really am confident that if we can, if we work together, we combine our efforts and work on joint clinical assessments and consultations, we can make sure that we can that that we address the most innovative and potential impactful health technologies. I will support the Commission and the Member States by ensuring that EMA continues to take a key role in bringing uh, the link between veterinary use and human use on the antimicrobial resistance. The lack of new antibiotics means we need more and more to support development of new and innovative medicines. And I think EMA's early dialogue program will help us in the context of the pharma strategy to explore additional ways and possible incentives. We must also preserve the effectiveness of the antibiotics that we do have. Um, and this is an area where we need to continue to advise on responsible use of both human and veterinary medicines and the potential impact on the environment. As previously mentioned, the next big step in the veterinary area, which will have a major impact in the context of antimicrobial 
actions will be the implementation of the new veterinary regulation. And I'm personally committed to ensure that the new rules can be readily applied when the regulation enters into force in 2022. But moving to another aspect of sustainability, if I could have the next slide, please. We need also to foster sustainability in other areas, in the areas of digitalization, artificial intelligence, big data, because these areas are transfer transforming the current landscape and changing the face of pharmaceutical development and, and approval uh, that I have known over the last 25 years of my experience. So we need to make sure that the network has the necessary competencies and resources to make the most of this change. I think the whole area of horizon scanning um, helps us to understand the likely innovations and what we need to prepare from, from a regulatory perspective, but it also helps us to identify the competencies and resources that need to be further developed and pooled from within the network. I don't need to tell this audience that digitalization provides vast opportunities for drug discovery and development, but digitalization also presents some challenges for regulators because the regulatory system was not built on the basis of digital, digital solutions. So we need to build on the steps that the EMA has already taken in integrating these into the regulatory framework. Uh, in, in this context, I think the work of the Commission on, on, the, on the plans to create a European health, health data space are in, particularly important. At the same time, EMA and the regulatory network need strong telematic systems to operate efficiently. And these systems not, need not only to talk to each other, but also to the wider healthcare data system. So we need better interfaces, we need better in, uh, integration, and this will help us enrich post-marketing safety monitoring. I, I, I couldn't stress more the need for us to continue to increase collaboration and engagement with our stakeholders. This is what this meeting is about. We need to, to further collaborate with stakeholders and downstream decision makers, such as HTA bodies and payers, so that we can prepare adequately for the implementation of the new legislation and make sure that we persevere on efforts to ensure timely communication and transparency. This is a time when regulators need to communicate, they need to show their strength, they need to be transparent. EMA will do this. So moving to my last slide, I'm very, very pleased to see that the challenges and opportunities that I have identified as a relative outsider, I will say, because I've been out of the system now for almost exactly four years, but I see that the, the challenges that I identified have been clearly identified in the European Medicines Agency's network strategy to 2025. You see the six focus areas on this slide. We'll talk about these six focus areas in the next, uh, in our panel discussions going forward. Medicines regulation in the EU is a true partnership. The contributors of all stakeholders may bring it all together. I'm looking forward to taking over the helm of EMA. Looking forward to being one of a new captain, uh, a, a, probably a very different captain, but a new captain of this wonderful ship. But I really would like to acknowledge the work that has been done by individuals at all levels of the network, without whose dedication, intelligence, and passion, none of this would be possible. And I I couldn't end without thanking Guido for all the support he has shown me personally in preparing, well, even before I was anywhere near being the a twinkle of, of the executive director, he has always supported me uh, through the 11, uh, since 2011. And um, he has he shown his strength to support me further to ensure a smooth handover in mid-November. 
I'd like to also acknowledge the work done by my predecessors, and I know a number of them are in the audience today. And I, I am really honored to become a successor. And the remarkable staff that have supported the work of the EMA over the years. EMA is an agency of which Europe and the world can be truly proud. I'm sure that the next 25 years, and I will not be around for those 25 years, but the next 25 years are going to be ones where the EMA will grow even further and the leg legacy will be enhanced. I thank you very much for the confidence you've shown in me, and I'm looking forward to taking up the baton and the challenges ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ima, and uh, I would like to thank all of you for your kind words and very, very important statements. I would like now to raise my glass. Unfortunately, this is a virtual meeting. It's only a glass of water, but I'm really looking forward to have a glass of wine in the future when it will be again possible to have this face-to-face -face meeting and then we celebrate all these uh, activities together again uh, when we meet. So, all the best. And now I would like to hand over to my co-chair, Noel Vatillon. And yes, please, Noel, continue with the meeting. Uh, thank you very much, Krista, and uh, good afternoon to all of you. Um, thank you, Krista, for co-chairing the first part of this conference. It's a pleasure to be co-chair of this meeting and share this moment with so many of you uh, today. During the first part of the, um, of the conference, we listened to introductory comments from the European Commission, from the European Parliament and from HMA. We heard Guido talking about the achievements over the past 24 years, 25 years, and we also listened to Imer Cook and the plans for the next years to come, acknowledging that the simple events such as COVID-19 shows how disruptive it can be in terms of planning ahead and that we need to be agile in order to be able, in order to address changing circumstances. Now, we have listened to all um, of you this, uh, this afternoon. It's time now to uh, reach out to our partners and stakeholders and to see what they think what comments, what feedback, what proposals that they may make. So uh, we are starting now part two of this conference, which is an audience discussion. And I hand over to Hans-Georg Eichler, our senior medical officer. Over to you, Hans. Thank you, Noel. And a very good afternoon to everybody who is joining in uh, on this virtual meeting. As Noel was saying, you have heard from us and you have heard about the regulatory signs and the network strategies. And in developing these documents, we have already widely consulted to learn from external stakeholders. We want to be a learning and a listening organization. So we want to continue the dialogue. And over the next 70 minutes or so, we invite all of you to share your thoughts on our actions and visions. We will be in listening mode and believe me, we are not shy to receive constructive criticism. We will structure our discussions around a set of questions, which you will see in a minute. And we have allocated around 10 minutes per question and want to give the floor to different stakeholder groups. I'm saying to manage your expectations, please, that we may not be able to give the floor to everyone. However, during the session, you can always share your thoughts via the chat box. You will find the chat box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. And when using it, please make sure you send a message to everybody, as we can only monitor non-private interventions. If there is a pertinent question, I will read it out loud, as not everyone can see it. In any case, be assured we will read all your comments in the chat box and take note of them. If you wish to speak, please raise your hand by clicking on the icon in the lower right hand corner of your screen. And once you have spoken, please click again to take your hand down. And please, when speaking, 
introduce yourself and please be brief so as to give others also a chance to take the floor. Everybody, please note, is muted by default. When I give you the floor, you will be unmuted by us. So, now, please let's get started. And could we see the first uh, question on the screen? Thank you. Um, the first question is a very general one, and we use this just to break the ice. This is about our role for public health, and we would like to know what you think of what is working well for us, what could we do more, and what could we improve on? Over to you. Please start raising your hands if you feel like you want to share your thoughts. So I see Josie Drabwell, I think, was the first hand up. Josie, could you please introduce yourself? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Josie Drabwell from IPOPI. And first of all, I would like, I cannot start the, the, the answering the question without saying congratulations to the EMA. It is a fantastic okay. anniversary. And um, I've been involved with the EMA since 2005 as a patient representative on the PCWP. And together with other patient representatives and consumer representatives, we have actually achieved and, and be involved in so many workshops, meetings, etc. And if I think, for example, about um, the information to patients and Black Triangle and the first public hearing where we were involved, I would say it's been a fantastic collaboration. Anyway, congratulations. I wanted to get over and done with first. <laughs> uh, now, um, I would say that what I have found is that the processes, they tend to take such a long time and the feedback can take months because of the regulatory system, I know. And sometimes you forget what the issue was about. So that's my first, my first answer. And I'm sure that there is a pathway for patients who have taken part in a clinical trial with a very positive outcome to have the ability to continue with this medication and off-label medication uh, for patients should be part of the assessment um, and the outcome taken into account. That is what I think um, SEMA could be doing more. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, first, thank you for your kind words and also for the suggestions about the role of patients and how to follow up uh, when a patient was in a clinical trial. Um, Another hand that I see here is Sini Eskola. Could we please unmute Sini Eskola? Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Okay. Hello. So uh, I'm Sini Eskola representing Innovative Pharmaceutical Industry Association, and uh, my role there is uh, Director of Regulatory Affairs. So first of all, of course, uh, um, thank you uh, and congratulations on behalf of FBR DNA on all the good work that you've been doing for the past 25 years and um, um, very comprehensive um, and interesting introductory presentations as well with which set the scene. So obviously um, from industry perspective, confidence in medicines evaluation is very crucial and it has been under scrutiny in the current pandemic. Um, FBI fully supports the establishment of the overarching strategic plan that has been described uh, in this meeting, and that itself to us promotes truly the confidence in the robust scientific and independent assessment and the EMA's primary goal to serve the public health. Um, we have provided um, in, in our response to the strategy already some concrete ideas for improvements, because of course, although there are many achievements, there is always some room for improvement. Some of those concrete ideas focused on um, escalating work on innovative clinical trials um, in medicines so regulatory network on behalf of the EMA, redesigning a modern, uh, more iterative, flexible, and integrated product support mechanism, implementing the real world evidence that was touched upon by the previous speakers, for instance, through cases um, or pilot program implement and really developing and implementing the overarching EU problematic strategy to enable digital transformation. Um, we would also like to suggest, um, and now uh, referring to the newly established four EMA task forces covering the digital 
for business transformation, data analytics and medicine, regulatory science innovation, and the clinical studies and manufacturing. And the reinforced and possibility for the stakeholders to interact with these task forces as we foresee them to be really the key driver and machine behind implementation of important regulatory science strategy, but also medicines network strategies. And we look forward to that. Do so in a collaborative spirit from innovative pharmacy, pharmaceutical industries perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Sini, and thank you again for your kind words and the ideas. Um, what you do the digital transformation, because we do understand that there is a, shall we say, perceived weakness. So allow me to park that for a moment, because we'll come back to it. Then I see a hand up uh, by Bea. Good afternoon, uh, uh, Beata Stempiewska, representing Medicines for Europe. Congratulations from our sector as well. Uh, it's a beautiful anniversary. Uh, in fact, the Emma, 25 years uh, of contribution to confidence in medicines and also to public health also covers uh, the development of generic and biosimilar medicine. It, in fact, you celebrate 25th anniversary, but at the same time, we celebrate the 15th anniversary of opening up the centralized procedure for generic medicines and, in fact, 20 and 15 years of establishment of the legal framework for approval of biosimilar medicines in Europe, in Europe which Vigo mentioned in his, uh, in his speech, uh, it happened in 2005 uh, as an outcome of the revision of the EU pharmaceutical legislation. Uh, today, thanks also to the access to the centralized procedure, which is the first step to the EU-wide uh, market authorization and access, uh, Generic and biosimilar medicines manufacturers uh, have become by far the biggest contributors to increased access to medicines for millions of patients in Europe. Um, actually, we look at the latest statistics from the 2019 EMA annual report, and uh, um, uh, it was uh, quite impressive to see that 50% of new applications in 2019, excluding orphans, uh, were coming from uh, generic and hybrid um, and biosimilar uh, applications. So I think it, it shows how much, uh, in fact, uh, we are, uh, are rely on you uh, in the assessment and how much, how important you are as a regulatory partner. Um, uh, also, Guido mentioned that uh, Emma has shown a global leadership in developing the scientific framework for development and evaluation of biosimilar medicines which has, been, has made EU an inspiration for the rest of the world, in fact, uh, and enabled also our members' companies uh, to lead in developing this uh, new medicine space. It has been an incredible contribution to public health, not only in the EU, but also worldwide. Um, and now, uh, looking now at 2020, we have a dream. No? We have a dream to build on the past, but also to look to the future. And we need, again, a leading role in, uh, in shaping the right environment for the future follow-on medicines uh, as a part of life cycle of innovation. It is really essential to feed the access equity ambitions set forth at the European Commission and, and this, to uh, take into consideration the specificity of development methodology of uh, collecting evidence and the impact on market access access um, and the fact that it needs to be tackled from a bit different perspective than for originators product. So we really need you again. We really need you again and we will very much count on Emma leading role in this space also to integrate this in your future strategy for next year. I really believe that patients will be grateful for this. Thank you very much. And congratulations well, thank you. and hope thank for the you. next 50 years uh, of great shape. Thank you very much for that, and thanks for reminding us that we're also celebrating a 15th anniversary. And please be assured we will not let you down when it comes to the access issue, but we have a separate question that again. Now, the next hand up that I can see is Ursula Aring. Could we please unmute Ursula Aring? Thank you. Please, Thank go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, my name is Ursula Aring. I'm with the European League Against Rheumatism. We're based in Switzerland and uh, we're active at Brussels level, clearly, and within EMA, usually through our professor, Marguerite Kloppenberg. 
I'm delighted to have the role of Public Affairs Manager, and I'm delighted to take part in this meeting today. Thank you very much indeed for inviting me and for including me in this. I've noticed a very interesting uh, point raised by Christine Den on the chat this afternoon, which I would like to take the opportunity to comment on. Christine Den refers to the need to potentially address media coverage in order to educate and uh, promote understanding in society at large of the role of the regulator and of the EMA. And uh, she has made a very important point regarding this in terms of uh, documentary style approach, uh, particularly in the times of COVID. I believe this would help, um, how do we say, raise public trust in the role of the regulator, raise public trust in the existing legal frameworks within Europe. Uh, if I may add on this point, uh, we all look to Trump's America, and we are currently um, in the situation where the great unknown might happen through the appointment um, of a new chief of justice in that legal system. Therefore, it might be an opportunity to act in order to gain public confidence in EMEA and also in the regulatory structures of Europe by looking into this point further. And if I may bring this question to you, what is the presence of EMEA in Brussels um, media at present? Obviously, Brussels being separate from society at large in its media uh, landscape. But may I put this question back to you? Has there been media activity by EMA in recent years in the Brussels arena? Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for the question. Please be understanding that I cannot, we cannot give you a response to that, but we will take note of your question and we will get back to you in the next couple of days. And I'm sure my colleague will take that up. Um, for this question, we have time for one more intervention, and that is by Bernard Grimm. Please unmute Bernard Grimm, but please keep it short, Bernard. Move, yes, thank you. Thank you. Question. Thank you. This is Bernard. I hope you can hear me. And again, congratulations for the 25th anniversary. We are just one year behind at Europa Bio. I'm the healthcare biotechnology director at Europa Bio. So the point I wanted to make is that the research and development of innovative biotechnology derived medicines, they require significant resources and investment and is best encouraged by a value-based system to reward innovation. Going forward, Europa Bio considers that one of the primary aims should be to improve the viability of the biotech and the biopharmaceutical ecosystem in the EU. This will support the development of innovative treatment for patients and should ensure treatment can be assessed as soon as possible. And for this increased collaboration with downstream decision makers will help achieve these objectives. But the intricacies of biotechnology derived medicines for human use should be better reflected. For example, many aspects of the innovative uh, biotechnology supply chain differ from conventional pharmaceuticals and require close proximity with patients, highly specialized manufacturing, and physician hospitals to administer care. Much of this relevant manufacturing is existing in Europe or is in the process of being established, but this requires intensive capital investment. And in terms of what could certainly potentially be improved, just to, to make it very brief, we believe there is a need to increase the collaboration between regulators, HTA bodies and payers. I think it has already been mentioned. There is also a need to properly reflect on the true implication and challenges of surrounding data and digitalization to ensure that we keep pace with technological and international changes. Uh, we would also welcome a standardized approach to the use of real world evidence and data that should be adopted. It's used in, gen in evidence generations for clinical trials throughout the medicines life cycle should be encouraged. And obviously, we take this opportunity to voice our readiness at Europa Bio to contribute ideas with a view of implementing those in ambitious goals that have been set during the presentation. So thank you again and congratulations. Thanks very much. And again, please be assured that we stand ready to collaborate with all of you and your organizations. And thank you also for confirming those priorities that you are bringing up now that we know are sort of the pain points in our future development. Now, in the interest of time, could I please ask that we see the next question, which is now more specific. 
And this is about the obvious, the COVID situation. Could we move to the next slide, please? Um, next slide, please. Question two. Thank you. This is about COVID, and we all talk about it. We try to do our best to fulfill our role. But on the one hand, we would like to hear from you what can we do better? Are there any gaps in our current approach? And the second part of the question, please, is this is not the last uh, health threat. This is not the last pandemic we will see. What can we learn from this pandemic and maybe adapt when the next issue comes in the future? So I see here, hand up, Alan Morrison. Please start. Uh, yeah, hi, Hans Georg. Can you hear me okay? Yes, very good. Yeah, thank, thank you. Just to add my own congratulations and also a personal um, uh, word of acknowledgement and congratulations to Guido on his retirement. I think your uh, humanity and uh, authenticity of leadership has really been a strong stamp in terms of how the EMA yeah. is running. So I uh, wish you well in your next uh, your next journey. Um, regarding the first part of the question, I think um, the point I'd like to raise is that we've seen a, a very strong response from the agency around how we interact with individual medicine developers uh, in terms of the um, scientific advice meetings I'm talking about um, for both uh, treatments and vaccines directed against SARS-CoV-2 um, and uh, including provision of new pro processes like rapid scientific advice. And we've also seen the stakeholder uh, meetings around the supply of medicines for, for an existing treatments. However, we think there's one area where FPA uh, and its members uh, would feel would benefit uh, from improvement, and that's a broader stakeholder uh, meeting to discuss general aspects of COVID-19 developments. And I'm thinking about things like here, like um, uh, upscaling of manufacturing. You know, uh, uh, it's uh, not only have to, to, to um, develop these uh, vaccines, and for, for, for example, 10 times more quickly than any other vaccine has been uh, developed, we have to manufacture them at uh, thousands of times the scale. And so uh, sharing collectively these types of um, um, uh, issues like uh, upscaling and the challenges of upscaling manufacturing capacity, or indeed, how do we collectively manage post-marketing pharmacovigilance requirements would benefit from uh, a, 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 or would benefit from more dialogue in platforms, perhaps, which are not uh, in a platform which is not covered uh, in currently existing platforms. Uh, and I think uh, the, the, the secondary benefit of this is, of course, these learnings would then be uh, translated to the, uh, the the broader innovation agenda, uh, as was outlined earlier by uh, Sandra, Galina, and Dimir Cook. And I think uh, these ways of working then would uh, potentially, that we learn through the COVID pandemic, would translate to uh, a, a broader innovative agenda for the future. So uh, that's my question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Can I please ask next speaker, Christelle Anke? Christelle Anke? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, very good. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm Christelle Anke Traxler, representing the Association of the European Self Care Industry. Uh, first, thank you very much for this invitation to celebrate together the 24 years of the EMEA. I mean, in these very difficult times, it's it's definitely uh, very good to be together, albeit virtually, to celebrate a, a happy event. So the COVID pandemic, uh, which uh, we faced with, uh, has highlighted amongst one of the, uh, I'd say, lessons uh, the importance of providing patients with the ability to manage their own health, uh, especially when healthcare systems are overburdened, uh, to um, the increased uh, availability of, of non-prescription medicines uh, is, is key. And we would like to underline that uh, regul regulatory flexibility uh, is, is also uh, paramount. As well, in the fight against AMR, uh, having more health literacy notably promoting understanding that antibiotics are not efficient against the majority of upper respiratory infections uh, should go hand in hand uh, with information on how responsible use of non-prescription medicines uh, and other self-care products can, can contribute. So thank you very much uh, again. Well, thank you, Christelle, for reminding us of this very important point. 
I'm now giving the floor to one more speaker for this topic, someone who hasn't spoken yet, Anita Simmons, please. Anita? Hello, thank you very much. Many happy returns. I'm a representative from the Healthcare Professionals Working Party, and myself and my alternate, Diego Villanueva, have uh, representatives on the COVID task force and we've enormously benefited in the last three weeks from sitting in on the task force, understanding the dilemmas with um, regulation of vaccines and, and medications and being able to vouch for the transparency of, of that process. Um, it's, it's been immensely helpful. Um, as healthcare professionals, I, I can uh, cascade that back to the to the working party and also I'm um, a part of the European Respiratory Society and cascade that information that the um, process is reliable it's being done properly to 40,000 um, respiratory team members. I, I think the one issue that would be really helpful is because we act as bridges and this is about confidence and understanding the process and particularly with respect to the vaccine, combating vaccine hesitancy and disinformation, how we can link our role in with topic that was raised earlier, linking with um, the EU projects on, on uh, disinformation and how we can aid you in having watched the process, vouch for it and link in with that messaging to the public, not least as healthcare professionals are trusted um, uh, people giving advice on to whether uh, the public should take out the vaccine or not. Thank you very much. Thank you. Again, a very topical and, and crucial point. Um, and we will come back to that later on. I see there are other hands up. Please do accept and understand that we cannot give the floor to everybody. Since we're running a little late, um, can I ask please to have the next question up question three please and this is a very different question that has already come up even in the short intervention that we have just heard this is about access and availability we know full well that regulators are only one link in long chain from innovation to the patient and there are other players in that field now our role is limited but is there anything we could do more, we could do differently to ensure that medicines that we approve reach the patients, which is the ultimate destination? And again, can I see hands going up, please? Yes, there is one. Ilaria Passarani, could you please be unmuted? Ilaria? Yes, good afternoon, everybody. And congratulations to the European Medicines Agency and all the staff for this very special anniversary. I'm Ilaria Passarani, Secretary General of PGU, the European organization representing community pharmacies. As PGU, we believe that to better address the problem of medicine shortages, it is necessary to create a stronger and more structured cooperation between member states at EU level. To this end, we strongly support an expanded role of the European Medicines Agency in the coordination of member states' activities on the prevention and management of shortages, building on the lessons learned during the COVID-19 crisis. The EMEA expanded role should be achieved by increasing resources first, and of course, by clarifying and updating the scope of its activities by amending the EMA Funding Regulation 726-2004. We think that one of the main activities of the agency should be indeed the central information collection and monitoring of anticipated medicine shortages at EU level, in close cooperation with the heads of medicines agency, so complementing existing national system through the further development of the EU SPOC and ISPOC system. This should go hand in hand with increased transparency and effective communication to the most affected stakeholders. Timely and complete information on anticipated shortages can reduce the negative impact on patients and also allow community pharmacies to better manage patient care and ensure continuity of treatment. However, across European countries, we still observe strong differences in terms of the legal solutions that community pharmacies can offer in case of a shortage. It is therefore crucial from our point of view for the scope of pharmacy practice to be extended when medicines are short of supply. This includes, for example, substituting with the most appropriate alternative as part of a shared decision-making process with prescriber and patients, or in accordance with national protocols where they exist, 
or for example, preparing compounded formulation when no alternatives are available anymore. Shared electronic record communication tools between pharmacists and prescriber, for example, shared electronic health records, can enable this process effectively and safely. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ilaria. We know your intervention, and this is a big topic, and thank you for also mentioning the word resources, which of course is an issue for us. Um, before I go on, can I remind all speakers to please take your hands down and please keep it brief others as well. Now, the next one is Eva Jan van Lente. Prepare. Eva Jan, please. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, I want also, um, I'm, um, first of all, I have to say I'm chair of the platform of payers, uh, Medicine Evaluation Committee, MEDEF. And um, in, um, for MEDEF, I would like to thank uh, EMA very much for uh, reaching out to us, to us as payers. Um, especially to Hans Georg and also to Guido supporting collaboration. And I don't have so much new issues, but I want to say that we should intensify in the future uh, collaboration because we have two big challenges as payers. First of all, we have the situation that through very high prices for patents and drugs, we have the situation that affordability in many EU countries is not guaranteed for new products. And therefore, we need a lot of data. We need data on relative clinical effectiveness. We need uh, cost effectiveness data. And we should, uh, of course, uh, also have data on safety, which is basically already done by the EMA. Um, and as everybody knows here in the audience, I think we as payers have different criteria as the EMA. And therefore, uh, I welcomed very much the, 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 the trajectory we started together to try to align how uh, what uh, requirements are there for um, uh, 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 for payers and for the regulator to take their their decisions. The other issue is that we have new technologies come to the market, which leads to potentially high, highly effective medicines, but the level of evidence is very low. So we don't at, at the moment of marketing authorization or uh, conditional marketing authorization. We don't know exactly. What is the value of this drug and how safe is it? And therefore, we should um, uh, we must look at uh, real world evidence and try to gather uh, together find evidence uh, after marketing authorization to reassess the drugs and find out what is the real value, so we can also reassess our pricing and reimbursement decisions. So um, thank you again, and uh, I hope this can be intensified in the future. Thank you. Well. Thank you, Everdian, and let me take the opportunity to thank you for building a bridge between the regulatory and the payers community. We both know that we will have to intensify our dialogue over the next couple of years for the reasons you have outlined very elegantly. Um, I then have Renz Gottenberg. Renz? Thank you. We can hear you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Renzo van Doppenburg, representing the Federation of Veterinarians of Europe. First, on behalf of FVE, I'd like to congratulate the European Medicines Agency with its 25th anniversary. We have seen evolving the agency over the years, including the increasing importance for the veterinary profession. Not only because of your primary work in licensing veterinary medicinal products, but also in taking the lead where it comes to fighting AMR, creating ASVAC as well as as well as others, a very impactful organization, EU GEMRE guidelines and more. And last but not least, doing the preparatory work regarding our new veterinary medicinal products regulation. And this all while moving to Amsterdam and dealing with COVID-19. Well done. Effie wishes you the best for the next 25 years and be sure we will continue cooperating with EMA. And then back to the question. As you may know, there is a lack of availability of licensed veterinary medicinal products for a certain species, a certain indication in a certain member states, is one of the biggest problems the veterinary profession is facing. And this includes temporary shortages. For that reason, a smooth working cascade is essential, not only on EMA European level, but also on a national HMA level. This especially is the case when importing products under cascade rules. 
And it does not only apply to the bigger products like some vaccines, for example, but also to the situation where one vet needs a smaller product. What further would really contribute is if EMA plus HMA can provide veterinarians with information on shortages. This is not the case today. How long they will exist and what kind of alternative products can be used instead. And for the last point, of course, no need to stress the importance of the Union Product Database we are looking forward to. Thank you. Thank you so much for bringing in the veterinary focus. Again, I have to regret that I cannot give the floor to all the other colleagues who wish to speak, again, for reasons of time, and would ask, can we please move on to question number four, which is about patients. Um, you cannot go to a meeting or read anything without stumbling across the term patient-centered drug development and patient-centered regulation, etc. But I'm the first one to admit I'm not always entirely sure what exactly that means, and I suspect others share the same weakness. So could please the audience give us your views on what elements related to the patient experience we should include in our decision making. Um, can I see, yeah, I see Josie, you have your hand up again. Please go ahead, but please keep it short. Um, I will. I didn't actually. I had my question up for the last time, uh, but don't worry. Um, again, I would uh, I would use patients um, in the definition of the endpoints and also the secondary endpoints um, because uh, I think that's important to have their opinion on um, clinical trials. And <laughs> my other point is that again, I would perhaps like to see. Um, patient representatives with more input on the CHFP. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very clear points. Very well understandable. Can I move on to Francois Huyer? Francois, please go ahead. Okay, if there is a technical issue, in the meantime, I would give the floor, please, to Magda Schlebus. Can we unmute Magda? Yes, hello, uh, and thank you for the floor. I hope you can hear me. And congratulations yes. also for the 25th anniversary to EMA, past current leaders and the staff. And I should say that patient engagement and patient centricity has probably been one of the big successes of EMA over the last 25 years. And you've been actively implementing patient centricity, even though you claim that the definition seems to be um, maybe not entirely clear. So. Um, we are also doing everything we can on the industry side to make patient engagement and patient centricity as part of our standard practice at every stage of medicines development, taking patient's perspective as a starting point of the reflection for development at any stage of the development process. And one point we would like to highlight is the research on patient preferences, including patient reported outcomes, which plays such an important role. Should should be incorporated and support benefit risk assessment of new medicines and indication and translation of these uh, to the label the patient information leaflet is very important this is an area which can certainly be further supported by the agency um, in this respect learnings from projects such as the innovative medicines initiative prefer or paradigm which deliver concrete tools to um, uh, implement these patient reported outcomes and patient preferences in decision making could be translated into the regulatory relevant guidance uh, just to give an example and question again to EMA, can um, you play a role in accelerating the translation of those findings from maybe sometimes discrete projects into the regular practice and uh, contribute to upscaling? Thank you. Thank you, Magda. What you said, I think, chimes well with what Josie uh, expressed as a desideratum. Now, could we please try Francois Huyer again? Francois, is your connection stable now? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Good exactly. afternoon. And, and thank you, Francois Yeh from the European Organization for Rare Diseases, or this 
I thought of starting to sing the Happy Birthday to You song, but I think there are much better singers in, in the agency than, than I am. Uh, I'd like to complete your question, adding the notion of on a broader scale, because a lot is already happening. And I think what is missing here is to benefit from the experience of those of us who participate in the evaluation of, of medicines by uh, providing data that they collect from their members or other organizations have experience in eliciting patient preferences. Other organizations will have the experience in revising the evaluation guidelines for their medicines, but not all organizations. One can define EMA as guiding the industry in the development and evaluation of medicines, but maybe what is missing is how can we guide all patient organizations, the new, including the newcomers, in participating in all the many activities at, uh, at the agency? I think we could co-develop how to. There are simple things such as how to know if a medicine is being evaluated for my disease, to how to elicit patient preferences, where do we start, how do we connect with academics who have the experience of doing that, etc. I think if we could write down some guidelines and make them available to more patient organizations, that would certainly be helpful, as maybe also to increase the visibility of the patient participation in EMA activities, to conduct some exit interviews for those of us who, live, who, who give a lot of time, sometimes who volunteer, for example, to, to be a member of a scientific committee, when they leave, we don't get the experience. We don't record, we don't interview them. them. Uh, why did you decide to join this committee? What have you learned? What would you like to share with, with others? I think there is a lot we could do to involve more patient organizations so that they would feel more at home when engaging with uh, the EMA and finding maybe more easily how they can interact with the EMA. Thank you, Francois. Very concrete suggestions, and we definitely would like to extend more of an outreach to organizations. With regard to the singing, allow me to propose we do the singing later on when we do the drinking. Now, again, I'm sorry, I think we have to cut this short. And could I please ask? We only have we have three more questions and 30 more minutes. Could I please come yet to question four? Um, this is about evidence generation. Sorry. Can I see the next? The next question. Yeah. Sorry. The research agenda. Um, this is no. Sorry. The next one, please. Yeah, this one. Thank you. Um, so what can we do as regulators to recognize and help may grill the potential of tomorrow's medicines, which we all understand that we've heard it already will be very different from the drugs of the last century. When we talk about last century drugs, I always think of statins. Um, the new drugs we authorize are very different. And could I please ask uh, colleagues to understand this is a double barrel question, and I'm looking for answers with regards to human medicines, but also for veterinary medicines. So, who wants to start, please? I see the first hand up by Ulrich Jäger. Ulrich? Yes, uh, so first of all, con congratulations from my side, uh, also as the co-chair of the Healthcare Professional Working Party. Uh, we value very much that you uh, integrate our voice in uh, your decision-making, and, and we have a voice in, within EMA, and that's uh, very much uh, of value. Um, Regarding the research agenda for human medicines, um, I think uh, we are all clear that we are going into personalization. However, uh, we feel that we do not always um, have the tools which are reflected in the current uh, clinical trial regulations. So I, I think, and, and that's a priority we know, uh, but we would certainly be um, interested in helping you develop uh, this type of tools uh, because we feel that uh, we need some new forms of clinical trials uh, and uh, regulations there. Uh, the, the other point, 
course, is that uh, we value uh, new tools as re like registries, etc., uh, which will increase the evidence that uh, particularly come from uh, users of medicines and uh, will help probably to shape this type of uh, programs for the research agenda. And if you allow me a final comment uh, from healthcare professionals as, investi as investigators, um, we are suffering from a lot of bureaucratic burden <laughs> and uh, we would need some help there, particularly uh, with the overload of unfiltered uh, information in terms of SUSA reporting, etc. <laughs> so I think if we could concentrate on the real important things, uh, we would probably improve uh, the quality of development of new medicines and uh, in the future. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Ulrich, and I'm not very surprised that as an investigator you speak about uh, certain conditions for clinical trials. So your voice is heard, please be assured. Um, I have had up here Nancy De Bruyne. Nancy? Good, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Uh, my name is Nancy De Bruyne, and I'm the representative of the veterinary profession, so I will answer the second question, and also part of the EMA Management Board. First of all, I also want to say congratulations to EMA on the 25 years. To be honest, I cannot imagine how it was 25 years ago without EMA. If I look at all the work EMA is doing, bringing together the whole regulatory network, how was this possible before? That's the question. Now, coming to your question uh, with regard to veterinary medicines, how can we use the opportunities offered by the new veterinary legislation? I think there's plenty. Um, when we go back, the, what was said by my colleague before, the biggest problem we have in veterinary medicine is the lack of medicines. In, in humans, you have already that problem, but you only have one species, humans. In veterinary medicine, we have a lot of species, dogs, cats, fish, even to reptiles, and they're all very different. So it is a very small market. Luckily, the new medicines legislation will give some tools to, um, to try to encounter this, like why further opening the centralized procedure by boosting innovation, by longer protection, data protection periods, limited market, and so on. And last but not least, union product database, which was also mentioned by my colleague. So we really hope that these new tools will drive innovation and bring more products on the market. A second issue we have very important in veterinary medicines, same as in human medicines, is antimicrobial resistance. And there we think the new regulation will bring huge steps forward because it has specific provisions on how and when to use antimicrobials and will further uh, also um, do the monitoring, uh, not only of sales, but also of use. So we really think on AMR, uh, EU is already a front runner and, and is driving research and, and we just should continue to do that and, and uh, to collaborate globally. And then the last point is, is for driving the research agenda is um, to ensure that we get rapidly vaccines for emerging diseases. Uh, we now have the example of COVID, which is a zoonotic disease, but with a very much a preference for humans. But we know that most of the emerging diseases are uh, zoonotic diseases. And, and we have some diseases also in, in the veterinary field that really uh, devastate our, our livestock uh, industry. So we have to ensure that we can develop uh, vaccines rapidly, both for humans. Well, I think one of the most important points, what, what was already said before by, by, by both Emer and Guido and others, is to bring all actors together, research, industry, but also the healthcare professionals and patients to know what are the real world's needs and, and to drive research. And EMA is already doing that and we welcome that this will be strengthened. Thank you very much.
thank you and also thank you for reminding us that the world of human and veterinary medicine is, are not two distinct worlds, but you mentioned the zoonosis, but that these are interconnected and the importance of collaborating within these two domains. Thank you. Um, we have time for one more, and I see Bernard Grimm. Bernard Grimm. Yes, thank you, Hans Jörg. It's uh, on this point uh, at Europa Bio, we would like to promote a focus on innovating clinical research as a priority. Uh, CTFG has started to engage with the industry on innovation in clinical trials, and the engagement and discussion should be regarded as a high priority. The areas for collaboration should include complex clinical trials and the network acceptance and support for new trials, including decentralized clinical trials. Furthermore, alignment on real world evidence and the related methodology and its use and acceptance are priority areas for collaboration as previously outlined. And then coordination of scientific advice across EMA committees and national competent authorities should be strengthened, we believe, with the aim to increase consistency. Uh, we would encourage the early inclusion of HDA payers, particularly in the context of simultaneous national scientific advice. In relation to this inclusion to the MHRA should be considered as part of the exercise. And maybe as a last point, because we are very active on the advanced therapies, regarding ATMPs and medicines and vaccines that contain or consist of PMOs, Europa Bio would like to be coll collaboratively explore with the NCAs and the European Commission whether GMO requirements are appropriate given the current state of knowledge, particularly given the recent derogation that has been applied in the connect context of COVID-19. And I stop here. Thank you, Jan. Thank you very much, Bernard. Some of the points you raised are a nice segue into our next topic, um, because you spoke about new clinical trial types, decentralized trials. Um, so can we please see the next slide, the next question? And this is a very specific scientific question. The reason we put it up here is because we know that there seems to be a rub. Um, in our earlier outreach, this topic came up again and again, and basically it is, well, the digital transformation, big data, all of this, could be a game changer in the way we uh, develop new medicines. But is the regulator up to snuff? Or is the regulator going to be a bottleneck? And therefore, the question we have for you is, what can we do to address this issue and to fully leverage the potential of everything we call the digital transformation? What is your views? What is your advice? Please go ahead. There is Nicolas Brun. Nicolas Brun. Thank you, uh, and happy birthday again. I'll join the choir. Um, the, the one issue, I'm representing the European uh, Alliance for Vision Research and Ophthalmology, and one issue that they have experienced themselves in initiatives where they're using the big data uh, is the GDPR. I don't know whether the EMA can actually do anything about this, but they have found that even hospitals within the same country, they can't actually exchange easy their data or pull them together uh, for benchmarking of hospitals. And that is, is, a, is an issue that is inherent in, in other policy portfolios. Uh, but that is, that is the experience from the ophthalmology community. Thank you. Well, thanks so much. We are very much aware that data protection may be, and I'm very careful the way I've heard this, may be um, a bottleneck when it comes to secondary use data. And we have been in touch with European organizations and the relevant bodies in that regard. We keep an eye on this. Uh, so that is something we should do on the political level. Is there anything we should do at our own level? internal kitchen. And I see um, Lara Solis, who hasn't spoken yet. Lara? Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Hi, this is Lara Solis from uh, IPOPIDO, International Patient Organization for Primary Mineral Efficiencies. Um, a big um, happy birthday to the EMI and all those involved. And I'll go to the question. I think uh, uh, interoperability of the system is uh, is key. 
um, I mean, right now we are facing that in some countries, uh, the data health systems are not interoperable in even in, in the same country. And when you change from a region to region, uh, you will face many challenges as a patient, uh, as a normal patient, to, to, to have access to your uh, health record. Um, uh, and then if you have a chronic disease, this would be even a bigger problem because that would uh, prevent you or, ha I mean, difficult, uh, make it difficult to change from region to region. So I would say that uh, making that sure that the uh, interoperability of uh, systems uh, works and is, uh, and is a reality is key. Thanks, very clear. But again, this is also something external to us, and I, your point is very well taken. And we'll try our best to work towards this goal of interoperability. Um, Annie Hubert, I see, I think Annie has not spoken. Yes, hello, good afternoon, and very happy birthday to DMA and all the colleagues so far who are working there. Um, so I'm representing the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine, which is a leading voice for the AT&P sector, um, and it's an international organization. Um, I'd like to highlight the importance of real-world evidence in the case of AT&P. This is really critical for this new class of products because of, the, of, of their nature and their very long-term effect after just one or, or very few administration. So we would really like to call for having uh, some pilot um, specific on ATMPs. We, we really see the urgency uh, specifically for ATMPs using real world evidence. This is really important, not only for the long term safety and, and efficacy assessment to really uh, characterize the profile of the product, but this is also necessary for HTA and, and payment because uh, very often you need to implement innovative payment models that need to be able to follow the, the long-term effects of these products. So we would like to call for um, having some pilot and, and uh, with as a priority ATMPs being used for, for real-world evidence. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. I think no one in our caucus will disagree that ATMPs are the cutting edge um, of these developments. Um, so we will very carefully explore what, how we could shape such a pilot and what we could do, because it's pretty obvious what you say. Um, can I come back again to Magda Schleibus? And then I think we move to the last question. Um, thank you very much, Hans-Georg Magda Hlebus from uh, the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and Associations, FPA. I think to respond to your question, I would like to highlight three aspects. Um, uh, first is that no party, as you've said, has all the knowledge and therefore in order to really progress on digitization, um, we need to co-create that knowledge together. So I think what collaboration would be a very important aspect uh, with all stakeholders including developers and regulators to actually develop uh, this new knowledge together and, and, and the translation of that of that new knowledge and science um, into um, into more effective processes and better products. The second point you've also mentioned, but I want to highlight it again, is clarity on uh, secondary use of data, reuse of data. This is really essential and there are many uncertainties. Um, I think the European Commission is already working on many enablers, such as the European Health Data Space, and I think uh, the agency's role in shaping that European Health Data Space for the need of biomedical research and regulatory processes would be very important important. Um, finally, um, and coming back to my uh, collaboration uh, point, uh, when we look at digitization, we look at the R&D processes, the types of products that we that we deliver, so not only pill, but also beyond the pill and everything that comes with it, and then the delivery of those um, innovations to the patients. All of that is heavily dependent upon data, um, including novel trial designs, decentralized trials, and everything else. I'd like to highlight again that only in collaboration between developers, academia, regulators, we are going to make a difference. So that would be our plea. Thank you very much. 
fully agree and thank you for being short. So that gives us one minute. Josie, you have spoken, but we, I would like to conclude that with a patient representative. Do you think you can speak in one minute, Josie? Oh, my goodness. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I think it is absolutely um, important, and I think especially um, as far as um, antimicrobial, that, um, uh, that this is uh, much more patient-centered, and the personalized medicine uh, should be the aim of providing this, and therefore knowledge should be shared in whatever way. Thank you very much. We will take note of that, of course. So, um, we're just in time for the last question. Can we please see question number seven? Now, this is not about research. This is really about open science or research methodology. This is about openness and transparency. And at the EMA, we are very proud that we have been the pioneer of transparency. We were the first authority to publish clinical trial data um, there were lots of discussions, and now a couple of years later, we would actually like to hear from external audiences. Do you feel that this initiative has had a positive impact on society? And was it worth the, actual, the effort, so to speak? And what aspects of the drug ecosystem, what more could we do? Um, so, who wants to start, please? I see Yanis Natsis, who haven't spoken yet. Please go ahead. Yanis? Yes, thank you, Hans Gerg. Thank you. Uh, I hope you can hear me. I guess, uh, happy birthday to the agency, first of all. It's, it's a great online event. I think the EMA, we agree, is one of the crown jewels of the union. And transparency is not a nice to have. It is clearly fundamental. It strengthens our work. It strengthens the work of the agency and serves to counter perception bias. It's obviously very important in maintaining uh, citizens' trust in our approval system, safeguarding patient safety, and advancing science. Um, I agree with you, the EMA has been at the forefront, uh, a true, I would say, pioneer in clinical trials data transparency. And this probably explains also why uh, companies have, from time to time, uh, taken the agency to court. Luckily, the agency still stands its ground. I'm also particularly um, happy to see that the agency is moving in the direction of more transparency uh, beyond open science, but also in the, in the area of pre-submission activities, including the provision of scientific advice. And I think it is important to highlight and to recall that now under the leadership of Guido, the agency is meeting all the, all the requirements put forth by the EU Ombudsman. Um, I think in the end, uh, looking back, uh, and before my time on, on, on the board and before joining the board as one of the two patient representatives, um, the agency could have done perhaps a better job in communicating the objectives and the rationale behind projects such as adaptive pathways. But that's history. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for your positive words and about coming back to the history of this debate. Um, I have... Denis Lacombe now, please. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, and again, congratulations also from, uh, from my side. So I'm Denis Lacombe, I'm the Director General of the European Organization for Research and, and Treatment of Cancer. Uh, so certainly, uh, transparency and the work done by DMA is highly appreciated. I have three comments, I will be very short. Uh, first of all, a technical one uh, is um, a drug, a drug database and accessing to trial results in the, uh, from there is not so clear how it can be optimized at this point in time. So there may be some uh, technology aspect actually that I hear from our teams to access uh, uh, data for, uh, from, uh, from there. Uh, so maybe we can uh, improve uh, the accessibility there. Second point uh, that uh, I would like to highlight, especially at the time where we have extremely complex data set, is whether in terms of transparency, DMA in the future, we consider independent analysis of data sets. <laughs> Uh, and um, and that I think would help in transparency. Uh, and the third one, of course, uh, would be uh, how far uh, data sharing can be facilitated uh, by uh, by the agency. 
Uh, and uh, again, it reach, it's also a question that was raised earlier is how far indeed it's a political, it's a political question, uh, how far uh, we, can, uh, we can circumvent the limitation of GDPR for data sharing and whether the uh, agency can help there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Denis. Just to remind you, the so-called independent analysis was part of the goal of transparency. We said by sharing data and primary data, we would enable exactly that. Uh, and your other points are also noted very well. So I had two hands, very brief. Uh, first, Sini, please. Sini Escola, you have spoken, but please go ahead. Keep it short. Th please. Thanks so much. I tried to keep bit short. Um, from every side, we truly commend the EMA for pioneering in this transparency space. It is really unique, uh, um, the, the leadership you've been shown, and very important in the global context as well. And my first comment there is exactly on that global context, which actually sometimes has made life a bit more complicated, um, as the global industry needs to really keep track on all the different um, regions, legislation and policies with regards to the transparency. So one of the requests um, for the regulators is also to keep a close eye um, and horizon scanning on the international transparency environment. Secondly, I, I would like, like to highlight that um, um, innovative industry is very proud and um, nowadays also widely recognized as to a certain extent leading the way in clinical trial data sharing. As we published 2000 14, um, something called Principles for Responsible Clinical Trial Data Sharing Initiative, including sharing of patient level data. That was done together with European and US um, innovative pharma industry. And this self regulation initiative really um, helped us to have the fruitful dialogue with the different stakeholder segments of what transparency, increased transparency can mean and um, how that can contribute to further research. Um, and I think also in the context of the EMA policy 70 or the proactive clinical trial data sharing policy, it has helped in those discussions and the fruit, fruitful dialogue of sharing learnings, what, what needs to be considered um, when we share uh, data and now we're looking ahead and um, looking into the patient level data sharing. So we are on the journey and we're very happy to continue being a partner in this in this journey while we unfold the benefits of increased transparency um, and the value what it brings to the citizens. I think um, further research uh, would be much welcome whether it's taken by academic institutions truly means um, to, the, to the citizens um, to see the increased transparency efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Sini, and thanks for reminding us this is a journey and we haven't reached the destination yet. So probably it's fair to say that the positive impact on society hasn't yet fully materialized, but that was not to be expected to be coming in a day or even in a year. Continue the journey. But I would like to conclude that point with uh, a patient voice. And I have seen Josie's hand up. Josie? Um, thank you very much. Um, I, what I'm really proud of is that um, I have been involved with all or many of the workshops before uh, it actually was published, the clinical data, the clinical trial data. So I feel as if it's a little bit my child as well. Um, and um, I tell you what I think with this. I think it is a fantastic tool, but unfortunately, it's a fantastic tool, but only to those who know about it. So I really do think it's up to patient organization and consumer organization and healthcare professional organizations, whoever can, is to actually widen the, um, the knowledge of it. Because I think it is a really important um, access to data if you're looking for something. And um, and, and I cannot stress enough how important that should be. So I think it's all our task to be involved and to make it widely known. Um, and just to talk about um, the, uh, the social media, I think to have it 
to have the EMA now on Twitter is so great because a lot of people who perhaps weren't aware of it are now responding. I've just responded and I see lots of people have responded to the Twitter that already was put on there. So fantastic. Congratulations. That's my final word. Thank you. I'm sorry. I had difficulty with my muting. Um, that you for the patient organizations and let's be very clear we will need all the support we can get from patients organizations to enable the sharing of important what is personal data including remark is 16 so in order to stick to timelines i propose to end our conversation here I want to thank all of you for your active participation, for your insights, for sharing that. And as I said earlier, we will go through what you have said, and we will also go through from your contributions. So thank you again. And with that, I want to give the floor back to Noel for the concluding remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Hans Georg, and uh, thank you for having shared the uh, audience discussion uh, so efficiently. So I am, first of all, uh, very pleased that we have been able to welcome uh, such a varied audience today with representatives from the European Commission, the European Parliament, national authorities, heads of medicines agencies, international partners, as well as former management board chairs, and I want here to refer to Sean Happel, Philippe Duneton, André Broekmans, Pat O'Mahony, and Kent Woods, and EMA executive directors um, uh, Thomas Lundgren and deputy executive director Andreas Spott. Importantly, we are very satisfied to see such well-balanced uh, representation from our stakeholder groups, including patient organizations, healthcare professionals and learned societies, academia, industry associations, both human and veterinary, HTA bodies, payers, and NGOs. In addition to the nearly 150 participants who joined this event, we have the broadcast has also been followed by an additional 200 people, which is a signal of the interest in medicines regulation. We have listened today to many of the achievements of EMA, and the network in the last 25 years. We have also heard we are looking beyond the COVID-19 pandemic, our priorities lie for the years to come and the areas on which our efforts and resources will focus. It is true that our last few years have been marked by Brexit and now by a much more serious threat with unprecedented public health and socio-economic consequences for our society, COVID-19. It is also true that this is a critical time for the agency, for the network, and for the world. But we should not allow this to overshadow today's broader positive reflection about the importance of our work and the advances being made in medicines regulation as part of the scientific, digital, and technological transformation which is ongoing in our society. What is clear from the discussion today is the level of interest the different stakeholder groups have in the activities of the agency and the European network and the importance they place on those activities. The agency and the network have built and consolidated over the years a solid foundation which efficiently protects public and animal health in Europe. As Guido already mentioned, throughout the years we have evolved, we have adapted and undoubtedly through the different challenges that we had to face, we have had ample opportunities to learn at a very fast pace. This has in turn emphasized the need to continue enhancing our strong partnerships with the network and beyond with international authorities. This will allow us on one hand to make best use of the available expertise, scientific expertise, knowledge and resources. On the other hand, increasing regulatory efficiency, flexibility and agility, ensuring that our procedures meet future demands in a sustainable manner and are able to respond rapidly to challenges. 
We have also heard the importance of supporting new ways of innovation, which inevitably will have a strong digital component, and of encouraging within our mandate that science and research are translated into new and effective therapies. And I stress again the fact that to guarantee new technologies and innovation to translate into real and longer term benefit for patients, we remain adamant that rigorous standards of pharmaceutical quality, safety, and efficacy will continue to guide our activity. We need greater integration to increase the value that EMA and the network can deliver in the wider policy areas. And for, for that, we have an important opportunity in front of us in the context of the network strategy to 2025, which you already talked about, and the EU pharmaceutical strategy as referred to by Sandra Galina. But while we plan for the future, I would like to stress how valuable it has been to pause a moment and appreciate what we have built also together uh, this, in this unique system of the EU regulatory network. Despite the fact that we had to overcome several imperfections throughout this journey, and we had to address its diversity and its idiosyncrasy, it's a great example of EU success and what the EU spirit represents. We can definitely say that our EU network adds value. The centralized procedure our strong pharmacovigilance system, the support we give to developers so that new and effective medicines can reach patients sooner, our efforts to integrate real-world evidence and new digital science behind our assessments and our unprecedented levels of transparency. They are all possible because of our joint action over these years and because of the input that the national competent authorities of the member states and their experts are giving to us on a daily basis. For example, when making COVID-19 vaccines and therapeutics available in the EU, I cannot conceive a successful response that does not involve the pooling of efforts and coordination, coordinated action from all the member states. EU authorities working together can best provide the strong response to the pandemic that the world and European citizens expect from us. Equally, I cannot conceive that we could face and successfully tackle the challenges we have discussed today without an even stronger collaboration with all stakeholders. 25 years ago, medicines regulation focused on its interaction with industry as main stakeholder in the context of applications for marketing authorization. Today, medicines regulation is broader richer, more interesting, and of course, more challenging. And it requires a multi-stakeholder approach operating in an open and transparent environment, which I hope you all agree we've, uh, we have worked to achieve. I would like to finish with a, a contribution I received from the first management board chair, Strom Happel, which summarizes very well in a few words. Today's EMA has two great assets developed over the past 25 years. The people who work for it and the reputation it has built up. The EMA has been very fortunate to have such committed and talented people working for it, both within the agency and in its partner agencies across the EU. They are a resource to be cherished. With these assets, EMA can face the challenges of the next 25 years with confidence. It is striking how the EMA has built up a global reputation for competence, for scientific expertise, for being trustworthy, and for independence of judgment. Each of these qualities is important and necessary. And like any regulator, EMA must be vigilant in maintaining these qualities, in particular, it must preserve its reputation for independence of judgment. A regulator that is no longer viewed as independent will not be trusted. And trust is essential in the regulation of medicines, perhaps more than any other field. This has been made clear yet again 
in the current debates on the efficacy of treatments and vaccines for COVID-19. That said, finishes strong, I'm sure EMA will be resolute maintaining its reputation, its reputation for independence of judgment. I would like to conclude now by thanking also on behalf of my co-chair, all speakers and all partners and stakeholders for their contribution to the achievements we have celebrated today and in advance for their help in addressing the priorities and the challenges we have ahead, including the most present, pressing one, the current pandemic. Also, I would like to convey, convey big thanks to Ivana, uh, Kuan, Nora, and Zenia for all your efforts in making this event happen. Finally, a personal note, for someone who has been at the agency from its inception, I can only echo Guido's words to say it has been an incredible journey and I too feel very proud to have been part of it. With that, I want to conclude. I would like to thank you all very much for having participated. I would like to uh, wish you a very nice continuation of uh, the day. Keep safe and healthy. Thank you and goodbye.